Welcome. Okay. Nice hey, to hey. meet you. Good to see you. But there seems to be a real personal urgency about this question. You describe it as a, a, a child playing with a bomb. Is that the case with superintelligence? Yeah, so at the moment we don't have any superintelligence like that. Um, I think that we are, as a species, developing increasingly powerful technologies that extend our ability to affect the external world and human nature. Uh, our powers are growing, it seems, much faster than our wisdom, mm -hmm. specifically with regard to uh, artificial intelligence. So it's not so much that I think like current computers are dangerous, mm -hmm. specific issues they raise with privacy or drones and whatnot. But um, my, my focus is regard to AI, specifically uh, the possibility in the future that you can have machines that surpass humans in general intelligence, that will have super intelligence. So I think that that will be a watershed moment, the most important event in all of human history. And what would um, super intelligent entail? What is, what is it? Well, I, I define a super intelligence as any intellect that radically outperforms uh, humanity in all practically relevant fields. So that would include scientific creativity, um, social skills and general wisdom. Um, so it wouldn't be just one more cool little gadget or uh, like a nifty innovation that would be useful, but it will be the last inventions that humans will ever need to make because uh, afterwards the super intelligence would be better able to do the science and technology and innovating than, than we humans would. And how do I have to imagine the step from um, narrow art, uh, artificial intelligence to super intelligence. How would that happen, this, this, this big bang or explosion you made? Yeah, well, so we don't know exactly, but so the idea is that um, there might be slow progress up until a certain level where the AI itself develops sufficient capability in computer science and engineering intelligence that it can then contribute to its own further improvement more efficiently than humans can. This might be a fairly high level of mathematical or sort of computer science research capability, but once you have that, then you might have this intelligence explosion, where for each subsequent round of improvement, the engineering intelligence becomes even greater and can find further improvement. I feel a little bit sometimes like we are ants. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we're contributing to some great project of building the ant hill. We're each very busy logging our uh, straw to the stack. But we spend very little time thinking about what kind of stack it is that we're building. So we've got to worry that all this progress that we're making, even though it might locally improve things, might be contributing to progress in the wrong direction. It's just that it looks like a very difficult problem that will have to be solved at some point, and we don't know how long we have available, so we should get cracking on it. Broadly speaking, there are two um, classes of methods you could try to use to solve this control problem, how to ensure that the outcome of an intelligence explosion will be safe and survivable. So on the one hand, you can have capability control methods where you would try to limit what the super intelligent AI is able to do. And maybe you put it in a box and you unplug the internet cable and perhaps you only allow it to communicate by typing text on a screen, answering questions that we would ask it. So in a sense, you clip its wings and try to tie it down. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, motivation selection methods. Uh, and these would amount to uh, trying to engineer its motivation system such that even if it could cause a lot of harm, it would choose not to because it would have values that would make it make the choices we would want it to make. The main danger there is existential risk, like ways to permanently destroy our future by creating a greater level of intelligence that will then shape the future according to its preferences. Those preferences might be completely meaningless and worthless by our light. So I think there is no inconsistency in imagining an, an agent that is super intelligent and yet his only goal is to say make as many paper clips as possible mm -hmm. or calculate the decimal expansion of pi to ever greater precision or having some other such meaningless goal. So if you now imagine a superintelligence with such a goal coming into existence, it's the first superintelligence, it's powerful enough that it can shape the future according to 
its preferences, then what kind of future would we get? Well, one with a lot of paper clips, mm -hmm. right? And so you can then think of uh, the instrumental reasons that such an AI would discover. It might not be that it dislikes humans or hates humans, but it would have an instrumental reason to get rid of humans because we might interfere with its design to transform the universe into uh, paper clips. Mm -hmm. uh, also, human bodies consist of a lot of nice juicy atoms that mm -hmm. could be uh, used to make some really nice paper clips. Um, so it would have these convergent instrumental reasons to uh, prevent other agents from interfering mm -hmm. with its goals and, and from acquiring as many resources as possible. So should we install what you call a kill switch to put the whole system down if it goes the wrong way, it goes off in well, the wrong I mean, way? probably a good idea to do that, but we shouldn't rely on that being effective. Like, once the system reaches a sufficient level of capability, it can anticipate uh, that, that humans might try to flick its kill switch. Mm -hmm. In general, the conservative assumption here, we would have to assume that any external safeguard that we might design with our limited human intelligence, the super intelligence might find a way to thwart. Mm. Just as if you might, and I don't know, like some chimpanzees, like keeping like a human locked up. I mean, they, they couldn't, we, we would probably easily be able to uh, like, I think, so it was for, for similar reasons, we, we shouldn't re just rely on us having like, like this little secret three ton weight that will be dropped down and smashed the computer if it does something nasty. Maybe that's an extra little safeguard, but we need something better mm -hmm. if, if we're going to have any confidence that it would actually work. Yes, because this doesn't sound really hopeful that we can control the super intelligence in this way. No, so I mean, while in the development phase, like while we are m working on the system, not yet a full-blown super intelligence, it might be very prudent to add these capability control methods. Um, but ultimately, I think we need to figure out a way to engineer the AI so that it would have um, human values uh, at its heart. Yeah, and so this looks pretty hopeless. Uh, yes. I mean, in, there are two problems. There's a technical problem. If you knew which value you wanted to give the AI, how do you actually get it in? Mm -hmm. To You have to program it in C++ or Python or something. So that, that's a big, difficult problem that needs to be solved. But then in addition, as you point out, there is the question of selecting which value to install, the philosophical problem of value selection. Um, so it seems that any attempt to directly specify a goal for the AI by like describing a future in a lot of detail and listing all the features that just seems bound to fail. Mm -hmm. The best current idea of how to go about these things, I think, is indirect normativity. So to make this more concrete, suppose you could give the AI the goal of doing that which we would have asked it to do if we had thought about this question for 40,000 years, let us say, and if we ourselves had been smarter and if we had known more facts. Uh, then you have translated the problem into an empirical question. It's an empirical question what we would in fact have asked the AI to do under such idealized circumstances. Then the idea is to sort of uh, lean on the AI's superintelligence to make better estimates of what the answers to that mm. empirical question is than, than we could do if we just tried to guess directly. Um, so basically trying to offload as much of this cognitive work onto the AI as possible, rather than try to solve all of these philosophical problems and articulate them all the way down um, to, to, to computer code directly, that which, which just seems hopelessly difficult. Uh, so there are other approaches as well, but that's, that's an interesting way of trying to sort of circumvent the need to actually spell out a full and complete ethic. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I'm very optimistic about the, the upside potential. Like if we get it right, if we make it through, you know, maybe this century, like then in, in the right kind of way, then, then the future could be, I think, wonderful, literally beyond our wildest ability to imagine. I think there are modes of, possible modes of being, states of mind and experiencing and feeling that, that just be wonderful beyond, beyond anything that, that we can kind of um, experience with our current human apparatus. But you get a telescoping of the future all the science and technology that we could do in thousands of years might happen within like hours or days or weeks or months with, with um, intellect that thinks at digital timescales instead of biological timescales. So the concern with the existential risks is not really in conflict with optimism about what can be achieved. In a sense, one motivates the other. 
uh, when, when you have something really precious uh, to guard, you, you become concerned with any possible threat that... that yes, but if it goes wrong, it goes terribly wrong. I think so, yeah. I mean, I think... So this is, this is the thing with an existential catastrophe. It's kind of an all-or-nothing thing. Mm. So we know in all of human history that will, when we look back at the end of time, there will have been either like uh, one existential catastrophe or zero existential catastrophes.